You're listening to the Visibly Fit Podcast. Hey, I'm your host, Wendy Pett, and every week I'll give you holistic, practical solutions for everyday issues related to nutrition, healing, functional fitness, and behavior modifications. As a natural path fitness expert and wellness coach for over 20 years, my goal is to empower you to reach for greater health and to rise up to your next level of living in mind, body, and spirit. You were created with greatness in mind. It's time to own it. Are you with me? Then let's dive in. Are you in pursuit of happiness or are you in pursuit of pleasure? Where we're going to talk about this today on this episode of the Visibly Fit Podcast. I am your host, Wendy Pett. Thank you so very much for tuning in today. I love spending these moments with you, and I hope that you glean a lot from this episode. So pleasure is uh, one of the things that we're really going to lean more into talking about because pleasure is a signal that our body responds to on a daily basis. And when we respond to that signal in a balanced way, that That pleasure signal can actually help keep us alive. But unfortunately, we as humans, we tend to abuse most things, including things that are good for us. That's right. Even that pleasure signal has been abused so much so that we might have fallen into what's known as the pleasure trap. And I have today with me my very first atheist and evolutionist to come on the show to share about the pleasure trap. Now, I share about that uh, because most of my listeners or viewing audience are Christians, uh, Jesus followers, however you want to put it. He knows I'm going to share that. But I'm telling you, Dr. Lyle is such a lovely human being, and you're going to glean so much from him. And I'm just honored to have him on the show. So Dr. Doug Lyle, we were actually at a healthy retreat, uh, an immersion, if you will, both, um, we're on the, on the team and I've been trying to get them on the podcast for years actually, and, uh, just got them on. So this is going to be a blessing for sure, but he is, um, and has been the clinical psychologist at the true North health center for over 30 years. He's published numerous articles in the scientific literature. He is the co-author of the pleasure trap and is in private practice conducting psychotherapy at the True North Health Center. Delightfully candid and warm, yes, he is, Dr. Douglas Lyle is one of psychology's most innovative and curious minds. Deeply dedicated to exploring the mysteries of human behavior from fresh, uncharted waters, his research in evolutionary psychology and his impact on health, happiness, and the pursuit of pleasure is generating critical acclaim. Now, Dr. Lyle is a graduate of the University of California at San Diego, summa cum laude, so he is very smart, and he received the President's Fellowship and was a DuPont Scholar at the University of Virginia, where he completed his PhD in clinical psychology. He was appointed lecturer in psychology at Stanford University and was on the staff at the National Center for Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder at the Veterans Affairs Hospital in Palo Alto, California. Dr. Lyle worked as a forensic psychologist for the criminal justice system in Dallas, Texas, and as a consultant for the National Institute of Health Clinical Trial on Cognitive Therapy for Recurrent Depression at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. Dr. Lyle lectures nationally to health professionals on topics including evolutionary psychology, cognitive therapy, lifestyle modification, relaxation and stress management, and weight loss. We had a great conversation, and I'm so excited for you to dive in to this episode today. Make sure you share this with others, and um, I'd love to hear your your feedback from, from hearing more about the pleasure trap. So enjoy the show. All right. Welcome to the show, Dr. Doug Lyle. This is so exciting to have you on Visibly Fit. Cool. Yeah. All. I can't believe you're with me finally. Oh, there you go. All right, Wendy, we got it done. <laughs> we got here. it done. We've been talking about doing this show for a long time, or I have. I'm like, I got to have you on. I got to have you on. All right. So um, I have um, uh, been 
kind of dancing with um, Dr. Lyle for a while about just coming on this podcast because he has such valuable information that I know will help you break through into a new way of thinking about your habits and and just kind of maybe where you're stuck. And so um, uh, Dr. Lyle has um, written a book called The Pleasure Trap. And actually, when uh, I'm not sure what episode it is, but Dr. Evan Queller talked about your book on our um, interview. Oh, so great. let's talk a little bit about the pleasure trap sure. and what that's all about. Well, <clears throat> the uh, people are designed to try to feel good. In other words, there, there's a reason why we have good feelings and bad feelings. And uh, good feelings are feelings that, that essentially encourage you to keep doing what it is that you're doing. And bad feelings are feelings that are saying, stop doing that, that this is not good for you. And so the um, and so uh, there's two different sort of big classes of feelings in in life, and one of them is going to be uh, sensations, and the others are going to be emotional responses. And so those are two sort of different domains, but they cross over. So the um, in the sense that we we can be emotionally excited about you know, about sitting down to a big you know dinner with our family. Okay, so we're excited about that. But that's different than the sensation of actually eating the food. Mm. So, so the sensation is going to be a, sort of a specific stimulus on a sensory nerve. Okay, so where emotional responses are really a lot about the anticipation of a sensory event. Mm. Okay, so okay. so emotional responses are kind of a guidance system that says, "Hey, it looks like things are heading in the right direction for a good sensory event." Yeah. Okay? Right. Right. So, like a guy on a hot, you know, looking for a hot date, it's like, Hey, you know, I mean, I'm excited about my hot date. Well, why is that? Okay. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So the, this is uh, how this works. And so, so uh, largely our, a lot of our emotional responses are, are what they are is they're sort of cues telling us about future sensory events. The sensory events themselves are sort of where the rubber hits the road. Um, even though both of them, it's interesting because we'll say things to people like, Hey, it was a pleasure meeting you. Mm. The truth is it wasn't a pleasure because pleasure is a very specific sensory event. What it really was, was a really good mood meeting you. Mm. Okay. In other words, so we should it, change what we say. Right. It's well, a really good mood meeting. You're right. Or <laughs> it, it creates happiness. Yes. So ha- happiness is a mood state that is very much associated with pleasure. In other words, it's anticipating pleasure or it's recounting pleasure. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm, it, mm-hmm. It's all in and around that. And yeah. so that's how we're designed to like when you're, you know, my cat's excited because I get up and I start moving to the kitchen. They're having excitement. Right. <laughs> all right? right. They're in a mood of happiness. Right. And, and why? Because maybe you in two the minutes, totally. That's exactly <laughs> how this works. Yeah. So, um, so you can so pleasure winds up being this unbelievably important signal that in psychology we recognize that these are this is this and, and neurobiology these are this is the this is the process that the mind recognizes that something really valuable for biology has taken place. So the two most valuable things in biology are uh, food for survival and sex for reproduction. So it's no surprise that if we study neurobiology, we're going to find that the, the uh, a flood of a chemical called dopamine in an area of the brain that we call the dopamine pathway, really imaginative. Mm-hmm. They also call it the reward pathway. Reward so sensor. it's like, okay, so we actually have something hitting a sensory nerve in a way that indicates that it's good for our biology. So we put something in our mouth that's tasty. The, 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 the mind says, yes, you need to be rewarded for doing what you just did by putting that in your mouth, because that's going to increase your likelihood of survival. Mm. So that's what pleasure is. Okay. So you can be pleasured in other ways. You can feel very pleasurable to be in a fireplace when our hands are cold. Mm -hmm. That also will cause a a little bit of a different chemical. It won't be dopamine, but it'll be endorphin. But both of these are the the two big pleasurable responses that that take place. And the pleasure trap, I knew you were getting ready to interrupt. I was getting ready You were going to too, Bill. (laughs) (laughs) The pleasure trap is, yes. Pleasure trap is when human beings have 
manufactured artificial levels of stimulation that cause the stimulation to be greater than it was in nature. Mm. And when you do that, it feels like it's a really good deal. It feels like this is the right thing to do. But the truth is, is it's kind of like putting jet fuel in your car. You know, if you did, you, you'd rev the engine and it would be like, wow, you know, now I can, this is amazing. The performance increases, but then we find out after 3000 miles, you burned out your engine. Right, right. Okay. So you can essentially like uh, a really, a fairly good example of this is young people listening to really loud rock music. Mm. It's like, they, the intensity, well, however it is that they make it a given song that some kid likes, it, he really likes the sound. He's designed, by, he's designed by nature to actually like the human voice and instrumentation, mm-hmm. okay? But he turns it on so loud, he does damage to his ears. Correct, yeah. And so the pleasure trap is, is about, is the story of how the modern food supply mm-hmm. has been crafted in the last really 50 and 75 years to turn itself into uh, something that's pretty um, uh, a perversion mm-hmm. of, of natural food. It's like and as, and as counterfeit. It's totally. Counterfeit comforts. You it's know? totally what it is. Yeah. And as a result of that, it's extremely compelling. It's very hard for people to stay out of it. And yet um, that battle of staying out of that trap, that's the, that's the battle of our lives when it comes to trying to uh, keep ourselves healthy and well. Yeah, no, that's, it's, it's really good. And I love the way you explain it because I don't think people think that they're in a pleasure trap. They think, oh, you know, I just went through a drive through no big deal. I can stop at any moment, but can they, when that next drive through of that same, uh, uh, you know, of, of, of the same fashion, the food that they really enjoyed comes by on that next day that they're feeling weak and vulnerable. Are they really going to be able to pass that up? You know, and, and you talk a lot about, um, uh, really that that path of least resistance mm-hmm. kind of a thing, right? Yeah. Let's let's talk about that because I believe that that's also, you know, a big part of this trap. Mm-hmm. You know, people want to conserve energy. Yes. And I I think, yeah, right. We're we're a bunch of lazy people. We want to conserve energy yeah. when we really boil it down. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about that when it pertains to um, our health. Yes. Mm-hmm. The that's actually great that you mentioned this because it's it's uh certainly right on top of the center of problems that, that we face when we face the pleasure trap. Um, there, there's sort of three different components to motivation that can be seen kind of globally and an easy way to conceptualize it, which is that we seek pleasure, we avoid pain, and we attempt to conserve energy. So we don't just want pleasant things and to avoid unpleasant things, but we want to be as efficient about it as we can. Okay. <laughs> and so you actually see that tendency, you see it all over the animal kingdom. So you'll see that the predators are designed by nature to go after the weak, the sick, the slow, the right. isolated, the injured. They just do that automatically. And they have instincts for that. And I watch these instincts in myself when, if I go to the gym, I'm all excited if somebody's pulling out and I get a better parking space. It's like, what is that? <laughs> Wait a minute. Like, why am I so excited? About it? <laughs> right. But it's, it, it's fascinating that, mm. that your mind is always angling and excited about possibly taking a shortcut, yeah. and getting more for less. Right. And right. so the, um, and the problem with this is that they want the hacks. Give me the, the, the yes. quick tip, the hack, the shortcut. Yeah, totally. Mm-hmm. And this is the problem is, is that when it comes to healthy living, we're actually talking about eating its food in its natural form, not in its processed, you know, right. all packaged up, you know, form that all I have to do is throw it in a microwave or whatever, and, or drive through. Mm-hmm. So we're, it's actually going to be more energy intensive. And right away, we start running into obstacles that, that our natural, our, our human nature is actually already fighting us, even when it comes to doing is something as simple as making a vegetable soup. Right. And so knowing that that's there is useful and important because it's important in understanding the value of having a disciplined kitchen and home mm-hmm. where we get, we get better at doing things, better organized. We kind of go up a learning curve. Um, and then we have, we're doing it often enough that we've always got healthy food around that we're now using up and then replenishing. Yeah. Um, a lot of people 
did, don't get quite far enough up the learning curve and they buy some vegetables and they throw them in the refrigerator and then they rot. And, they and rot. two weeks later, they throw them out and then they do it all over again. Right. That, they kept them in the, the plastic <laughs> that they bought them in and they forgot what was even in there. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so the energy conservation um, is a, a, an important thing to know that you're fighting that and that you have to make an energy investment. And, and, you know, really quick, when you make that energy investment, like in the kitchen, for instance, mm -hmm. and you're cooking healthy, nutritious, God-given foods, you're going to get more energy, which mm -hmm. is interesting. If you're going to, you know, uh, take and expend some energy on going for a walk, you're going to get more energy. It's it's the opposite of what people think, right? Yeah, because uh, they're, they're following really short-term intuition and feedback. Yeah. And so the, um, but we've all felt it, like sitting in front of the TV and things are kind of a mess and you just don't feel like doing anything. But if you get up and start moving and you get a few things done, suddenly you get some momentum. Right. And you feel better about yourself. Definitely. Yeah. There's no, yeah. No, this is a, but we have to make some of these investments and, uh, and yet it's actually going partially against our nature to do that. Mm. So that's, uh, so that's, that's really kind of what habits are is they, what a habit really is, is that we've gone up a learning curve enough that it's no longer that energy intensive to get something done. Right. Okay. Right. And so now, now we, get we find ourselves doing it over and over again because we we're good at it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that, that's uh, anyway, it's important for us to know that we have to make an investment because the, the default in the modern environment, literally all of corporate America is they're, they're whether they are doing this, exactly consciously or not, which I think they are more and more these days. I think so. They're trying to literally figure out what tiny little changes that we can make that will save them a little bit of energy. Right. It's like, it's critical. Not to, just save them energy, but make them more money. Sure. No, but I mean, <laughs> right? saving energy to the oh, consumer. Oh, the consumer. Like sure. every uh, little thing yeah, okay, yeah. is all about making it a little mm. bit easier. Don't make it too hard to open that package or they won't buy it twice. Interesting. Let's make sure that it's super easy. Yeah. I had a... Uh, Huh. I had, there, there was a lady in one of our programs that, that uh, was raising seven sons in the Midwest. And she, uh, she came to the seminar and then told us later about a, a fascinating thing that she did. And that is that she went home and she's trying to, you know, feed these kids healthy food and always did, but she had a colander and put grapes in it and washed them out and put them in the refrigerator where they're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And like a day later, none of them are eaten. And she thought about this concept and she said, you know what? I'm going to run an experiment. And she takes out a bowl, pulls all the grapes off the stock and puts them in the bowl. They're all gone by the end of the day. Interesting. Like, Those boys <laughs> are unbelievably lazy. Like literally their, their energy conserving mechanisms are intimidated by the little fact of having to pull a grape well, off a stock. Isn't that fascinating? Isn't that amazing? Right. And yeah. that is why it's so vital and so important in the kitchen to peel, prep, chop, and prepare for the week so that you don't have to think about it and that you are set up for success, yes. right? Yeah. Because the more you have to go in and go, oh, yep. what am I going to eat? I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> you there know? you go. It's, it's, it, you know, you're going to uh, end up tripping and, and maybe failing. Yeah. So, um, you know, what... What else would you say to someone that's listening that's like, you know, I, I think I'm kind of stuck in the pleasure trap. I, mm -hmm. I I didn't think of that until now. What would you say to them on, you know, how do I get out of the pleasure trap? What is that first step that I take? Um, there's some useful things to know about the pleasure trap. And that is that it's there's a bunch of little features. But one very important feature is that the pleasure trap is runs pretty hot on uh, memory systems. So let me explain why that's true. Um, and in this way, are you talking about memory, like as in your past childhood neurological association no, stuff? No, absolutely not. Okay. Okay. So let me, let me tell you about <clears throat> how important memory is in life. Like you couldn't function without memory because you, you, you wouldn't even remember what it is that you were thinking about saying 10 seconds ago. Right. Okay. You wouldn't have remember. You wouldn't remember your name. You wouldn't remember who you liked and who you didn't like. You wouldn't remember where you are in the country. But when you start realizing, oh my gosh, I'm unbelievably dependent upon memory. Right. Okay. Now, so it's going to turn out that that na nature is very crafty. It it makes sure that you remember things that are very important. Mm -hmm. Okay. Whether they're good or bad. So if you had really bad things happen to you, you'll tend to remember those because 
you need to be able to avoid similar things in the future. Protection. And if you're very good things that happen, you need to remember those because you want to repeat them. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. So I want you to think about, um, uh, let's suppose we all live in a village somewhere, I don't know, in somewhere in, let's, let's say Fiji. I like Fiji. <laughs> no, we're not going to do Fiji. There's a reason we're not going to do Fiji. Okay. We're going to do, we're going to be, um, 500 years ago in what is now Georgia. Okay. Okay. All right. We'll go with so that. we're kind of the, these folks living off the land. And uh, we live in a place where down uh, we down a river, there's a little grove of peach trees. Mm-hmm. That's why I said Georgia because uh-huh. peaches. Uh-huh. All right. So <laughs> the I don't know if they I don't know where how they got there, but there they are. So there's a grove of peach trees in our little village of people. You know, we obviously love those peaches. We don't live down there because there's some bears that live around there and they're not particularly aggressive, but you just soon not cross swords with them. So we live like a mile away from the bears. And, but every springtime we start thinking about, huh, I wonder about time for those peaches. Somebody goes down there and it's like, okay, well, they're not ready yet. Okay. So we go back two weeks later. Now there's some peaches. We bring them home. Everybody's eating peaches and they're like, wow, these are really good. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's going to turn out that we're going to be thinking about those peaches every day because we just had them yesterday. So today, but, but everybody says, no, we know there's no ripe ones yet. We're going to have to wait a few days, but we're not going to forget. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. So another day or two goes by and then, you know, I say, Hey, I'm going to go down there and we're going to go look some more. So we go down there. Oh, there's a few more. We bring them back. We eat the peaches. Remember it again. So we're going to go through this for the next couple of months. Now, finally, two months from now, we're going to go down there and we will have got the last three peaches off the tree and bring them back to our people. We divide them up carefully. Harvest is over. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> one now, for you. One for right. Exactly. And now, though, what's going to happen in the next week is that people are going to be thinking, I wonder if we missed any. Mm. Okay. And sooner or later, one of us is going to say, you know what? I'm going to go down and check. Okay. They're so they're going to hike all the way down there mm-hmm. and they're going to check every one of those trees and they're going to come home and they're going to say, nope, that I, we're done. Okay. Now, now what's going to happen is they will still be thinking about those peaches every few days, mm-hmm. but then after finally about three weeks, they won't because they're out of season. Okay. Okay. So your mind is smart enough to know that if we're seeking something and then we it's valuable and we try to get it and then then we try again and then we try again and then finally if it if we can't get it we can't get it. The energy conservation system runs essentially a probability analysis hmm. on whether or not we can get that resource. It judges how much time and energy it's worth including the sophisticated mechanism of bringing it up in memory. So it literally has sophisticated files that will say, well, how long ago did we have those peaches? Oh, it was just a week ago. In that case, I want you to remember that because that resource may still be in the environment. Mm. Okay. And it's also willing, you're willing to take the risk of the bear, the walk, the the time, the energy to get them. Totally. Because it's that good. So now, so now we start to see really how behavior changes and what's what's causing the behavior that you see in the motivation. Mm -hmm. It's actually super sophisticated biological calculus. Okay. And so we see that after three or four weeks, the people in the village don't even think about the peaches. It doesn't even cross their mind. Mm. Okay. It might cross my mind three months later and I'll be saying to you, oh, I went down you know, I, I went down there with Joe and I were talking about that thing with the mockingbird. We were down there picking peaches. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? That's how it'll occur to me. And then we might say, yeah, be sure. Can't wait for those peaches again. But that will be the only time that whole month that I'll even think about peaches because the mind has actually realized that resource is no longer available. Mm. Now, that, however, Remember how often it was crossing my mind when it was in season. Right. Every now, day. I've just described exactly the problem of being a drug addict. Mm. That people, the problem that they must go through the first three months of not drinking alcohol for an alcoholic. Sure. It's they had it. It's been in season. 
Yeah. It's been over and over again in their mind. They just had, they just were drunk four days ago. Mm -hmm. They can remember it extremely well. And the reason why it's such an addictive process is that that alcohol is a supernormal stimuli concocted by man that results in a hyperactivation of the dopamine pathway. Therefore, it is signaled as extremely valuable. And so as a result, don't think four days is all it's going to take. Mm -hmm. You're going to be thinking about that and having it cross your mind and motivating you to go get it. And if you go for 10 days and then you're like, well, just one drink, well, just one drink, you just brought it back in season. That makes so sense. now we start all over again. Mm. Okay. Notice that quite a few number of people, not it's not easy, but a lot of people have beat the alcohol problem. Yeah. And notice that when you talk to them, they'll tell you, yeah, I've been sober seven years. It's like, interesting. If it took the kind of willpower for seven whole years that it took in the first three months, nobody would succeed. Right, right. It is impossible. Yeah. You notice that when you meet somebody that's, they're, they'll, I've met many people, 25 years. It's like, if we thought, if anybody even imagined that you could do 25 years the way the first two weeks were, there is no it possible, wouldn't happen. no human on earth has that kind right. of willpower. So it's the same with food. I mean, yes. big time. This yes. is exact same with food. And I think people don't realize yes. the drug that food can be. Correct. Right? Yes. And to get out of that cycle of the pleasure trap, you have to give yourself some time, some major accountability, yeah. and and the space to forget. Yes. Right? That's exactly yeah. what I'm saying. That and you, not, don't put those French fries in your mouth. That, <laughs> the, right? I would say this, that, that with food... Um, Supernormal stimuli, i.e., drug-like effects on anything. Yeah, they there. There's two variables that are important. One is that these things differ in stimulus intensity. Yeah. So caffeine is not cocaine. Right. Okay. Yeah. Cocaine, literally, a cocaine addict that has one line of cocaine, they can just have crashed their whole life. Mm -hmm. They just brought it back into season and that it could terrorize their existence. Moderation kills momentum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So good. So the, but with caffeine though, caffeine is one tenth of cocaine. Sure. Okay. So as a result, you know, th that is not crashing the car at the same magnitude. Food is kind of on the level of caffeine. Mm -hmm. It's a mm -hmm. intermediate, moderate, intermediate level drug. That's right. what it is. Right. So if you if you indulge a little bit, you haven't necessarily crossed the whole car. You just tease the system. And the problem is, if you tease it, then for the next three, four, five days, that little thing is going to be saying, it's back in season, it's back in season. Ah. In other words, it's going to be thinking about it, that it's not going to draw you in like a vortex the way relapsing on methamphetamine would do. Sure. But it's still, still going to have still a formidable. call. It's formidable. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that's why people will say, well, gee, what if I have one cheat day? It's like, well, no. you're just asking for psychological turbulence. Thank for you the for saying time. that. Yes. People okay. ask me that all the time. I'm like, no, moderation kills momentum. You're yes. going to go right back to the beginning. That's right. So, so. I'm no fan of that. But yeah. what I also know is that like once in a while- None of us are perfect. Once in a while, I'll indulge sure. and then I'll know Oh yeah, I this just is brought back in season. <laughs> okay, <laughs> the peaches are back. And, then, and, and you know what? There was a uh, there's a Jap Japanese restaurant. A funny little story. There's a Japanese restaurant that I go to, and I always get the same food. And they know who I am, so they they're like same thing, no, same thing. <laughs> and so, but at the end, what they used to do is that you'd have to have these little chocolate mints. And boy, I was always looking forward to those mints. So I go there. I I'd probably go there twice a month. Mm -hmm. So I kind of forget about the mints. You know, I go there for the food and they're like, oh yeah, that's right. I'm going to get a couple of those chocolate mints. Right. And then inevitably <laughs> driving home, I'm thinking, I wonder was there someplace where I could go get more of those mints? Always crosses the mind. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. And it would, it would tumble through my mind a few times over the next 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And then I would forget about it. Okay. So just a little tiny ding in the system. Yeah. Um, and it, oh, then what happened, interestingly enough, is that they uh, then it, they changed ownership and the guy quit. He stopped the mints because there was, you know, he's, the guy came out with his pocket calculator and realized yeah, it was costing him $7,000 a year or whatever it was costing him. And he was like, no, we're going to cut that off. And I remember like, I was irritated. I was like, wait, <laughs> what's the deal? Anyway, but now it's funny because 
I still go there and I don't even think about it. Mm. Never even occurs to me. So I had to go there 10 times and not get it and remember and be irritated. And then now it's completely wiped out of my mind. Except for the story. Yes. Except for the story. <laughs> so yeah. So in season and out of season is... No, I think an important thing for people to to be aware of. That's a great way to to just have that analogy and just um, dumb it down, if you will, and just make it simple for all of us to say, okay, you know, not that we're we're dumb because we're not, but I'm just saying for us to understand that, okay, this really isn't my fault, so to speak. Yes, right. And I think that that's what I want um, my listeners to hear is it's not your fault, you know, but we can correct this and um, and you can you can tackle it and make a, a big difference and and change your lifestyle. Um, you know. You know, a lot of times people say, oh, 21 days for a habit, 28 days for a habit. Mm -hmm. You know, do you even, I, I don't believe in that for me personally, because mm -hmm. I think everyone's different, but what is your take on that? Yeah. The, the people that are saying that um, don't actually understand what a habit is. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, I don't mean to be mean to these people sure. because all they're doing, uh, very often human knowledge comes first with some decent observations, but not an understanding. Mm -hmm. And so the people that are talking about habits are making observations, but they actually don't have an understanding of what's happening. So the reason there's a reason I told you that story mm -hmm. about in season and out of season, um, because what, what a habit actually is, there, there is no such thing as a habit. All there really is in human motivation is biological calculation of what's in your best interest. Right. So Going back to food, and food and, food and reproduction gotcha. and pleasure seeking pain avoidance and energy conservation. In other words, so what happens, what habit took place when the peaches came in season? And then I habitually went down there every three days to check for the peaches answer. My memory systems ran a cost benefit analysis that said it was very likely that there was going to be peaches down there. Mm -hmm. And therefore I ought to go down there and get them. Right, okay. Right. Then what happened, what habit changed after I went down there one last time, a couple of times, and clearly convinced myself that there wasn't any peaches, still had thoughts about it for another two or three weeks, and then finally quit having thoughts about it at all. Right. What habit change? Yeah. Okay. Right. No. And, what in quotes for those right. of you listening? Air That's quotes. Air quotes. <laughs> what it real? What really changed was my deep biological calculus changed according to my ability to run estimates mm. about what was in my best interest. Right. So that's why, quote, making good habits, it doesn't happen in some automated habit-forming fashion. It, it is a calculus that changes as a result of the circumstances, you know, uh, changing. In the case of like, if you start doing things at home, what's going to happen is you'll start to get better organized. Right. And you will also, incidentally, get better at doing those things. Yeah. Your, your mind actually um, builds skill through a process of, it's called wrapping the myelin sheath. You, your your mm -hmm. brain actually gets more skilled in the same way that somebody that plays tennis or golf or anything else it's or playing efficient. piano, you get you actually get more efficient. Mm -hmm. uh, that's when, when, some, when you're learning to play the piano, what's actually happening is the brain, the motor systems in the brain are being altered to get more and more accurate at doing, punching those keys. Mm -hmm. And the same thing is going to happen in the kitchen. Right. All of these things are, are going to take place. And it's that practice makes permanent, right? Yes. And I learned that actually from my son when he was very young in school, because mm -hmm. I used to always say, well, practice makes perfect. Mm -hmm. And he's like, no, mom, my teacher told me practice makes permanent. And this was like third grade. <sighs> and I said, oh man, you are spot on. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. So I remind him or he reminds me yes. of that often. Like, remember when I told you that? Yeah. So, um, but yeah, it is, it's that practice. It's a repetition. Yeah. And so um, for, for those of the, those of you that are listening, they're like, yeah, you know, I, I've tried another air quote. I've tried and I've tried and I haven't succeeded. What would you say to that person that has tried uh, to get in their healthiest, best self, but they haven't succeeded. Do they, I mean, because every personality is different, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, more accountability. I mean, what what would you say to that person that they may need? I would say that there's some things that they need to um, to get into place that are, are, are likely to head us towards permanent success. The Remember what needs to change is ultimately the biological cost benefit calculus. Right. So right. that's why we need to make enough of a change in the short term so that you can actually see the benefit. 
unfortunately, for many people, you won't see significant enough benefits for maybe three weeks. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this makes it a difficult experiment because human beings weren't designed to be running three week experiments, right? They're designed to be running 10 second experiments, right? We need to okay? hit success. They, you're, if you're trying to learn to do some motor thing to, to a mock, you know, make a moccasin or shoot a basket or fish mm -hmm. that you're, you're designed to look for very quick feedback. That's why you'll see some of the greatest, um, skills in the world that you'll ever see are going to be in sports or in music mm -hmm. because you, if you hit the wrong note, you can hear it immediately. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. If you eat the wrong thing, you can't see the heart attack per not, probability go up. Not instantly. No, yeah. you can't yeah. see it. And so as a result, you weren't designed to be running such a long-term experiment. Mm. So if you know that you're not designed to run a long-term experiment, and you know that the only way that you're going to shift your, the direction of your boat towards a better uh, thing is not some magical habit, but in fact, a deep biological calculus where your mind just says it's worth it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. In order to do that, we have to understand that we're facing a problem that you weren't designed for. You're facing a problem of going away from something that is artificially telling you that it's a great thing because it's counterfeit dopamine. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's luring you in and you have to run an experiment for long enough that your body and, and mind can feel the difference. Mm -hmm. Now that I think is, it is a legitimate thing to say, Hey, let's do this for three weeks. Yeah. Let's make no joke out of this. Right. So carve instead of be all in, we're not trying to trick you into this. We're trying to give you informed consent over how it is that you live your life. If you are continually in the pleasure trap and getting teased and are bogged down uh, uh, by the burdens that come with it, you actually do not have informed consent. Yeah. You are making these decisions. Your mind is making these decisions and it's actually in the dark about incredibly important evidence. Mm -hmm. The important evidence that I've seen over and over again at running many programs, uh, the, the McDougal program, in-house program used to be 10 days. You would see people... You know, obviously we do the food just like we're doing the food here at Whole Foods. Mm -hmm. The when the food's done for them, guess what? They didn't have to put out any energy. Right. And so now they're like, hey, when they go back, that was a pretty good deal. <laughs> yeah. And they're actually willing to do it. You know, what I mean, even uh -huh. though, even though there's, you know, there's McDonald's across the street somewhere. But the truth is, it's like, hey, this is pretty good. Mm -hmm. The and so many people will say, gee. If this was my environment, I could do this. Sure. The problem is, is that there, there, that food isn't simply out in your environment at a drive-thru. Right. And right. it's competing with crap that is. All the time. So that's why we have to be willing to go to that, say, a three-week investment. Right. So that your, you can start to sense and feel some significant changes in your body. Yeah. And you can realize, wait a minute. This is a this is a legitimate option for yeah. changing my life, and, and it is here. worth it, and yeah. you're worth it. And um, you know, I often say when the pain is greater than the circumstance, then people will change. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, is that people's pain threshold is different. Yeah, <laughs> um, sure. but but true, right? Like if the pain is is enough, then most people will change and do something well, I can, about I, it. I, I can mean, tell you one of the most amazing things that we yeah. we have seen. Um, you know, turn or over the last 40 years. And that is that if we have somebody come in, that they have a condition that causes them acute pain, if they get one inch out of line, mm -hmm. they do really well. Mm. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. If there's someone that, you know, has a little bit of elevated insulin resistance and they're carrying around 30 or 40 pounds, but they don't really have any symptoms at all. It's like, oh, this is going to be really hard to get yeah, that person to change. My blood work looks good. And I, yet good you, tell, you can tell that they're on the verge of sure. being pre-diabetic just by totally. looking at them. Yeah. Or they might be diabetic, but right. it's not too bad. Right. Okay? Not too bad. <laughs> but if you have somebody with you know, an ulcer. Because they're clients, not on meds. Yes. You say that. I'm fine. I'm not on meds. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the, the problem is, is that, that there isn't usually an immediate payoff. Mm. So, but, but oftentimes if people will... Uh, people that come to us are aware enough that they know that they're not on an optimal path, that there would be a better one. And yeah. it would they'd love to be there, but the short-term little experiments that they make 
Like they eat one healthy meal and they're like, yeah, but where's the ice cream now? Yeah. In other words, <laughs> those little tiny did my duty. Give right. me, give me a reward. Yeah. It's not enough of an experiment. Mm. Okay. Mm-hmm. And to, to wrap back to where I began this thing, remember that we would never expect somebody that's getting off alcohol to, uh, to be able to do what they do in the first 21 days for the next 21 years. Right. They couldn't do it. It turns out it gets a lot easier. Yes, it does. Okay. Yeah. I can right. remember um, doing this in stages uh, 40 years ago bit where I got off of, you know, animal flesh, mm-hmm. but I sort of didn't know what to eat. Mm. And so I kept, I, I, I grate cheese on my whole wheat spaghetti and, you know, in other words, so I'd have right. pasta. Right. I know you don't do that now. <laughs> no, no. So I'd have pasta and I'd have tomato sauce on it. And then I, I felt like I still needed something. Yeah. And right. so I'm, I remember grating cheese on that. And I did that for a long time until I went back and reread the McDougal plan mm-hmm. another two or three years later. Right. And it says right there, you know, uh, what? milk and dairy products, dairy. like liquid meat. Totally. And I'm like, yeah. Okay. And then I read all the evidence again. And it's like, the addictive I'm gonna, nature of cheese. Oh my. I could tell you, <laughs> I, I noticed something immediately within, you know, two or three days, <clears throat> suddenly I wasn't waking up congested. Okay. You just said that right now. I yeah. just talked to some, okay. So we're at this uh, event together. If y'all are just listening and not watching, but uh, cause we're just in a conference room, but I just talked to somebody at lunch and he is a dairy guy. And he said, Oh my gosh, I, I woke up for the first time in the middle of the night and I could breathe. It was like, my sinuses just opened up yeah. and that was after two days. Yes. So you experienced the same, same thing. thing. Yeah. I experienced that 40 years ago. Yeah. And that, that it just is, it isn't like I didn't test it. Right. So of I've tested, tested it over the it. years. And- <laughs> That's how I can tell if some chocolate I got into w- had milk in it. It's like, cause the next morning I can feel it. Ah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah invariably. Mm-hmm. It's like uh, once in a while that will happen to me and I'll wake up the next morning and I'm a little congested. I'm like, what did I eat that had dairy in it? You know what I'm saying? Sure. Like it, it, it's, it's sensitive. now become a, a device that I can tell. Yeah. The, um, but that, that I forget where I was going with that. But anyway, the point is, is that for me, it didn't happen overnight. It happened in some stages. Yeah. You put a little cheese um, on top of your pasta and then you moved correct. on. Correct. Then, yep. you, then you move on. I morphed it into yeah. a, a McDougal program. Yeah. And the, uh, but, oh, I was going to say, I don't just, just like a, a, an alcoholic that's been dry for 30 years. I don't even think about animal food and I would never, I personally right now, I'm not some holier than thou person, right? but I wouldn't even think of eating any cheese. Right. It's completely outside of my thing. And yeah. the same you way don't that crave it, don't need it, don't think it's about not it. in season. Right. Now, right. An, another thing that's, that's, mm-hmm. that's interesting about this is that, that um, probably you, you have to be careful when you bring things back in season. So probably if I ate a pepperoni pizza, Mm -hmm. you'd be like, that would rattle my head for days. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Sure. So uh, in the same way that if you're an alcoholic and you're dry for 10 years and then you decide you can get a little arrogant, Mm. it's like, I must must not have a problem because I haven't had a craving in 10 years. Right. How big of a problem could it be? Right. And the answer is just about that time, you're underestimating the pleasure trap. Right. Okay. Right. And the same thing is true with people with their diet teasing Mm -hmm. their diet. Like Mm -hmm. it's not as intense as that, but it is similar. Sure. If you, if you wander from the flock, as Esselstyn would say, Uh you are, you know, now you could, you're putting yourself, you're making yourself vulnerable. Sure. So we we try to keep it as clean as possible. That's so good. I love all the analogies and the stories. That's, that's awesome. I think you're painting the picture really well. Um, You know, you, What would you say, especially in this day and time where there's a lot of um, mental health um, issues, um, really, uh, what would you say to someone who might be struggling just mentally, um, just struggling with the stress of the world and the, just the, just the way the world is right now. I mean, I'm not going to go into all the de- sure. details because we all know, right. What would you say to that person that they can get to a place where they can be grounded and just centered and say, you know what, it's okay to focus on me and do these healthy things because it does leave a ripple effect. And the ripple effect that we want to leave is vital because it, it's, it passes down generation to generation, right? <laughs> I would say this, yeah. that, 
um, it, it's it's very easy. The world now, probably more than ever, uh, I'm not I don't want to discount problems in the world because sure. there are problems. But the world now, more than ever, surrounds you with essentially vipers trying to get your attention by uh, uh, essentially the old philosophy in journalism was if it bleeds, it leads. Mm -hmm. In other words, get people's attention, get them afraid, get them scared, get them intimidated and get them feeling a sense of urgency because that's how we're going to get our clickbait to work. And that's how we're going to sell something, a wheelbarrow. Who knows what it is, okay? But the point is, is that we have to recognize that your your just as the peaches are and how soon you got them is rattling around your memory bases trying to rearrange priorities for what you do in the next three days right if you're inundated with all kinds of worries about the entire world this is not in your best interest right you're in your best interest to 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 live like a, a person in a small town or in a small community yeah. and have your your interests and your concerns being very parochial and have them also be relatively simple. Yes. Okay. Simple. That's actually how we were designed. Mm-hmm. We were designed to live in relatively small groups and not be worried about people a thousand or 5,000 or, or 80 miles away. Yeah. It's, it's good. keep it local and keep your life, you know, we are, are going to be aware of wider issues, but really the truth is most of your life is lived between you and, and 25 other people. I'm so glad you're saying this because we do. We think we get everything bombarded, uh, yes. being told through the news and mm-hmm. the, the, this is the biggest in yes. our cell phone, right? Sure. But um, it, it just causes this anxiety and yes. depression and all this stuff that doesn't need to be going on. And so if we can just, like you said, focus on the simplicity mm-hmm. of living and understand your role in your tribe, in your community, mm-hmm. in your family, then man, you're going to just be a lot happier, right? Yeah. What we're seeking ultimately is balance. Yeah. So the the concerns of the outside world need to be a peripheral 5%. Yeah. You know, we want to know if there's a tidal wave coming, a tsunami coming. Right. Okay. Yeah. So w- we need to keep a quarter of an eye open, focused on that. But almost everything else should just be focused on the people and the and the things that matter the most to you. Yeah, that's that's so good. Well, you lead by example with that. And I love everything that you share. So thank you for coming on Visibly Fit. I'm a big fan. And uh, if you want to check out uh, Dr. Doug Lyle and check out his podcast, it's Beat Your Genes. Mm -hmm. And it's a great podcast, but also your website is? Uh, Esteemdynamics.com. Esteemed? Esteemed Dynamics. Esteemdynamics.com. I'll put that in the show notes as well. But thank you so much for tuning in to Visibly Fit. I know you were blessed by this episode. Make sure you share it and I will see you next week. Take care. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Well, that's a wrap for today's show. So thank you so much for tuning in. I love spending this time with you. To learn more and get more free resources, just head on over to wendypet.com. And thank you in advance for sharing this episode and this podcast, following and subscribing, not only to this podcast, but finding me on social media, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, wherever you are, I'm probably there too. Until next week in our next podcast time together, make it a visibly fit day.